Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDEP and ESTCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDEP and ESTCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERDEP and ESTCP by Mr. Timothy Petro, followed by a list of upcoming webinars in the series. After Tim's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. Today's event features two presentations on cost-effective and resilient building-scale microgrid solutions for increased energy security. First, Mr. Ryan Ferris from Raytheon will discuss a development and demonstration of a zinc bromide flow battery for a microgrid. His presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. Second, Mr. John Sossel from Bosch will talk about a building scale direct current microgrid platform, followed by a second Q&A session. We will conclude the webinar with an interactive Q&A, including both of our speakers. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions well in advance of that session. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in the event that you experience difficulties with the broadcast audio. Typically, any delay will be fixed if you refresh your screen or call into the conference line. However, if you continue to have problems, please submit a comment using the chat box in the left lower corner of your screen. With that, I would like to introduce Mr. Timothy Tetro, who is the ESTCP Program Manager for Energy and Water. Before joining CERDEP and ESTCP, Tim worked at the National Renewable Energy Lab, where he focused on energy efficiency and renewable energy project development for the federal sector. I'm turning that over to you, Tim. Thank you, Rula, and uh, welcome everybody to today's CERDEP and ESTCP webinar. I'm gonna have a few slides here just going over the background of, this, uh, of the CERDEP and ESTCP programs, and I'll hand it back to, to Rula. Uh, to introduce the presentations. So the CERDEP program is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. It was established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the DOD, the Department of Energy, and Environmental Protection Agency. CERDEP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. CERDIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately, ultimately impacts real-world environmental management. The ESTCP program is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under the CERDIP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important to the ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. The CERDIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERDIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, and while the ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally there are some supporting lab efforts conducted. There are four program areas in the CERDIP uh, and five in ESTCP. Energy and water program area is only in the ESTCP, while the other four, environmental restoration, munitions response, resource conservation and climate change, and weapons systems and platforms, are both CERDIP and ESTCP programs managed jointly by a designated program manager. Our webinar today is focusing on research and demonstrations that were conducted under the Energy and Water Program area. The Energy and Water Program supports a, a variety of demonstrations and in innovative technologies, primarily in three areas of research. 
one, smart and secure installation energy management, which include microgrids, energy storage, and methods for participating in ancillary service markets. Two, efficient, in, efficient integrated buildings and components, which includes a broad array of technologies. And three, distributed generation, which covers technology that provide power to buildings, support microgrids, or help DOD uh, achieve its energy goals. Today's webinar will, be, will present results from two projects funded under the um, Smart and Secure Installation Energy Management area of research. The CERTIP and ESTCP webinar series um, highlights research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. You can see here a list of the upcoming webinars that cover a broad range of topics, including quality assurance project plans for geophysical classification investigations, insensitive munition, munitions, remote methods for water conservation, and environmentally acceptable alternatives for fast cook-off testing. Um, you can uh, learn more about our webinar series at our website, and here's a link on this, uh, this page. And uh, I thank you for attending, and I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Rula, back to you. Thank you, Tim. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ryan Ferris, who is a Systems Engineering Manager at Raytheon with over 15 years of experience in materials engineering and systems engineering. Mr. Ferris currently operates as a Department Manager within the Systems Development Center for the Space and Airborne System business. He manages a group of 120 systems engineers responsible for providing system architecture, performance modeling and simulation, and project leadership primarily for electro-optical products and technology. Ryan has a Bachelor of Science degree in Materials Engineering from um, the California Polytechnic State University, uh, a Master of Science degree in Materials Engineering from the University of Southern California, and a Master of Science degree in Systems Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And with that, I turn it over to you, Ryan. Thank you, Rula. Okay. Whoops. So for our particular project, uh, I will start to go through um, where we are doing a demonstration of a zinc bromine flow battery system um, for both energy security and operational cost reduction applications. Uh, for this uh, presentation, I'll give you an overview of the system, give you some idea of what it's made out of, um, you know, how it works. I'll also kind of go through a little bit on the objectives, what were we really trying to achieve. Um, I got some nice pictures that kind of show the evolution of how the system came together uh, throughout the, the years that the, that the program um, was operating. Um, because we're at the tail end, um, we've pretty much finished our demonstration of this particular project. I'll show you um, some uh, snapshots of kind of like how the results, um, and then I'll finalize the presentation uh, with some of the, the lessons learned and the conclusions of this particular project because we're at, we're at the end of it. Uh, for our project, um, we are a zinc bromine flow battery. Um, the intent was for this particular project was to uh, improve uh, the energy security of a, uh, a military facility um, by uh, enabling islanding um, as well as some operational cost reductions. We coupled um, this microgrid type solution with some advanced microgrid controllers. We call it intelligent power and energy management. Um, you know, that, that Raytheon put together. We had a variety of partners on this particular program. Uh, Raytheon was the prime. Uh, Primus Power uh, was a, a supplier for the zinc bromine flow battery. Um, Dynaelectric was our construction contractor at the military facility, and MCAS Miramar was our uh, host location and technically kind of like our end user for this. Uh, we did have uh, some, some nice involvement from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in this effort as both kind of like a uh, consultant because of their ongoing efforts that they have um, at the Marine Corps base, as well as kind of like an uh, independent third-party um, assessor for some of the, uh, the report activity that we, we generated at the end of this particular program. 
So the intent of our particular um, program uh, at MCAS Miramar, they, they do have um, a certain uh, amount of existing renewable energy uh, assets available on the base. Our program uh, was intended to leverage energy storage in the form of a zinc bromine fuel battery, integrate that with some of the, uh, the renewable ener engineer or, uh, uh, energy assets that they have on site, implement that with some uh, advanced microgrid controls, uh, enable the system to island as well as operate in a peak shaving mode. Uh, the benefit that, that we were hoping to get out of this uh, from the government standpoint was that um, uh, a lot of information on the ability to leverage energy storage uh, technologies as well as microgrid controllers um, that can be implemented um, in future microgrid designs for potentially all renewable type systems. Um, and again, we were very lucky to have our host site be the Marine Corps Air Station uh, Miramar down in San Diego, California. Now, uh, as part of some of the objectives that we were trying to see, one of the primary objectives for this particular program um, was to improve the en energy security of the facility. And we were going to achieve this by operationally islanding a building circuit uh, for a target of 72 hours um, by, you know, isolating the power from a simulated grid interruption at standpoint, leverage the energy storage in the PV uh, during that out outage, um, and then monitor and control the system uh, to maintain operations. And I have a, another uh, slide where I'll uh, explain the CONOPS of this. Another secondary objective for, the, for this particular program, because uh, we're trading the ability of, uh, for energy security of backup, you know, diesel generators as a, as a lower cost alternative. Um, you know, the, the ability to leverage energy storage for uh, operational cost reduction because you can use the assets, um, you know, frequently throughout. They don't only have to be used for emergency power. We were uh, trying to showcase that you can use the energy storage uh, for peak shaving capabilities um, to potentially generate some operational cost reductions. Um, so basically, your you know, your uh, demand load shifting um, by charging at night and then discharging during peak times uh, during the day. So for our particular setup at the base, um, this is where I'll go through a little bit of the con ops for um, how the uh, system kind of behaves. So when we had the microgrid system kind of all uh, set up, the intent was to be able to uh, ride through a, uh, an event that would cause an outage at the facility. So, um, you know, scenario would be that there's some type of either event, a wildfire, some disruption at a power plant, um, you know, maybe a, a cyber attack or, or whatnot that would cause a disruption. Um, and that would be stage one. Stage two would be um, the microgrid controller would recognize there's a disruption uh, of power to the facility. Um, it would recognize that, provide that information to the uh, user of the facility uh, so that they can take some form of action and decide whether or not they want to go into a, an islanding type of a situation. Uh, the microgrid controller would then, um, at the point of common coupling, isolate the system um, and then activate islanding mode. Step three would be the battery system, the energy storage system would uh, initially pick up the power and provide that voltage regulation and initial um, uh, current to the system. Uh, you know, returning power, returning all the lights back on uh, would be stage three. Uh, stage four, because we're trying to leverage renewable energy assets on the base, uh, we wanted to be able to uh, incorporate that as a generation source during the outage. So the microgrid controller, um, monitors and controls the solar PV output uh, in addition with the energy storage uh, to maintain power quality in the system because the power quality uh, is, you know, very important because there, uh, there are devices and whatnot within the buildings that can be sensitive to, to changes if the power quality is poor. Uh, so therefore, we're, you know, step five is to maintain these critical loads for the period of time and ride through the outage. Um, essentially improving the energy security of the location. That's, it. And that, that's the islanding in a nutshell. So for us, this program kicked off roughly about 2012. 
the uh, first two years of the program was essentially um, ironing out the actual microgrid systems design, working that out with the base in terms of how the operations and the construction and the planning of all that needed to progress. As well as um, when we started off the program, the energy storage system, um, you know, was still, uh, had been demonstrated, you know, in the lab environment. They had their initial prototype um, of their energy cell uh, operating. Uh, they needed to, time to be able to scale up the system. So for the first two years, uh, was building up the, um, you know, 250 kilowatt unit from their uh, lab demonstrated system. So that took a little bit of time uh, to occur. Around the time period, about 2014, once we had the microgrid design pretty much uh, well ironed out and the uh, system level concept for the uh, energy storage system was in its uh, build stage at that particular point, we wanted to do a lot of risk reduction testing because this would be the first time this particular unit would be married up at uh, Miramar. So in uh, 2014, we worked with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, they had their brand new ESIF facility just commissioned at particularly at the time. Uh, they had some capabilities to be able to bring our microgrid controller, bring certain elements of the energy storage system into their lab, recreate the circuit that we were going to microgrid um, almost, um, you know, as probably as high a fidelity as you could um, with programmable load banks. They had the um, PV inverters already kind of on site, the same ones that we were using and interacting with at Miramar. And we did a, a lot of microgrid testing with the power electronics of the uh, Primus Energy Storage System with our microgrid controller with the uh, simulated load conditions um, well ahead of our actual deployment uh, out at Miramar. This gave us a lot of experience. We were able to hash through a lot of the controls, you know, on the power electronics side, the controls um, and the DC controls of the battery. A lot of those things become important to maintain proper um, power quality output for the system for the load conditions. When AC systems kick on, you get big load steps. So uh, the other thing we wanted to make sure is the stability of the system because we're an all renewable based microgrid. There's no uh, inertial sources on this. So we have, um, you know, a PV inverters and we have a, a battery inverter that are providing our generation assets. When we start integrating those two together, we wanted to make sure that the um, when we start ramping up the PV and in, in sharing that power generation with the battery that we don't run into um, controls on each element kind of uh, fighting against each other. We wanted to maximize the amount of PV we utilize so therefore the battery output is minimal, minimal and it's just kind of providing a voltage regulation source. So we're able to actually do a lot of that demonstration in 2014 at NREL um, and you can see, at least in the um, graph on the right, where during this time period we were able to ramp up the PV penetration in the lab, you know, close to about 100 percent of where the battery is just sourcing out uh, voltage um, and, and, and nothing else. Um, and we were able to maintain a, a stable AC power output. So it was a very important activity we were able to conduct late in uh, 2014. Uh, so on the heels of, of completing the, the testing we did at the uh, at NREL, um, around um, earlier in, in 2015, uh, Primus was ready to finish uh, do their first article testing of their energy pod system. Uh, we flew out to, to their facility. We watched the uh, the, the system go on to um, acceptance testing, uh, and then once the acceptance testing was complete. Primus was able to deliver the battery out to, uh, to Miramar. Um, and so the pictures you're seeing on this particular side is the, the battery arriving um, out at the, the, the air station. Um, when we get to these large scale energy storage systems, the, you know, they're not meant to be compact. You know, when we get into the, the, the advantages of low cost energy storage system, you got a little bit more space that you got to deal with these. So these things are heavy. So you can see the uh, crane that we had to use to, to lift this thing off of the truck. Um, it was quite fun. They, you know, basically lifted it up, uh, you know, a couple of feet, rolled the, uh, the, the truck on over, and then dropped the battery back down in place. 
Uh, very nerve-wracking to see this thing, you know, lifted up off, off the ground for his, uh, the amount of energy and time it took to build this unit. But all in all, you know, it was great. They, they got it down on the ground and they, they rolled it in place. And this really encompasses just the energy cells packaged into kind of like the energy pod. The power electronics is in a separate uh, container that goes along with this. Right around the same time that the battery was installed in 2015, the microgrid controller uh, was installed. Uh, we co-located it with where the uh, inverters were for the existing renewable energy system at the facility. Uh, the pictures you're seeing is just kind of evolution inside the room where the inverters are of the, um, you know, the existing wall that, that was there, moving some of the equipment over, installing the microgrid controller. Um, and then as it stands today, uh, you know, the, the, the smarts and the brains of the system that, that tracks and monitors the energy storage, uh, manages the PV system, and also provides um, interaction with the, the end user. There's another uh, workstation inside the building where the end user manages, but this is the, the heart and the brains of the system for the microgrid. Uh, another aspect of this, uh, when we went through the initial uh, design phase of the program, because uh, you know we were uh, modifying existing infrastructures, one of the trades that we, we understood is that the switch gear that was part of the existing infrastructure needed to be updated. They had uh, about 230 kilowatts of PV already uh, attached to the existing switch gear at the base, but because we we're adding the energy storage unit to the same switch gear, with a common uh, point of common coupling, we needed to update the AC bus on it because the existing one couldn't handle the increased current if both sources were generating power. So therefore, we had to go out and design a new set of switch gear. Um, you know, to be honest, the switch gear was actually one of the you know one of the difficult things to actually you know get designed, get on order, um, and actually get delivered. Uh, apparently, a lot of the switch gear manufacturers are on back order. These things are not necessarily easy to put together overnight. It takes time. Uh, there's a lot of checkouts that, that need to occur. So the switch gear you can see in this particular photo is it being assembled you know, at the manufacturing facility. Um, this is it installed at, at Miramar. Uh, we also had to install disconnect switches and provide metering for the energy storage unit per our interconnect agreement with San Diego Gas and Electric, which is representative of the, these disconnect switches. We also had to upgrade the transformer as well because, you know, similar to the uh, switch gear, the AC bus uh, capability for the transformer um, was too small, so we therefore we had to buy a new transformer as well as um, you can see a lot of the uh, devices and whatnot that need to go inside the uh, switch gear, um, you know, can be very complex and, and getting, through, getting through that and getting it done right, you know, takes time and careful planning. Now I'll talk a little bit about um, the process that we went through for uh, getting our interconnect agreement with San Diego Gas and Electric. Um, this process can be somewhat cumbersome. Um, experience with other um, principal investigators I've talked with on other programs, you know, a lot of it depends on the utility company that you're interacting. We submitted ours roughly about 2014, when, once we knew every, all the design and everything was laying flat. Um, the big component of this for the energy storage system is really understanding the power electronics um, information that goes along with it. So we had to make sure that was laying flat before uh, we had the details of the interconnect agreement. So we submitted in 2014. We, we were granted a permit to operate, you know, roughly about 2015. It took about a year to get through that process. Um, but having all of the right information for the energy storage unit and its associated power electronics was critical uh, in terms of UL safety because that was what the um, utility company cared most about was the safety ratings and how did it behave, um, was it tested, and what certifications did you have on the power electronics. Um, and once we had that all reviewed and approved, the interconnect and permit to operate came relatively quickly. So just one of the experiences we had with working with the utility company. So roughly about October 2015 is when the system was fully commissioned. Uh, we had the interconnect agreement all approved. Uh, San Diego Gas and Electric came out. They installed their meter, gave us our permit to operate. 
Uh, Primus went through their initial checkout because once the system's delivered, they had to bring all the energy cells online, uh, make sure their um, environmental control system was working, all the safety systems inside the pod were working. Um, all of that was completed around the fall per uh, time period of 2015. And the photo you're seeing is kind of a nice photo that, that Primus Power took. Um, you know, at MCAS Miramar, you can see the uh, solar carport PV system is one of the generation assets we're leveraging at, at, at the base. Here's the energy pod with all the energy cells in it. Here's the um, power electronics uh, that come along with the battery. Um, this room right here is where the inverter um, and the microgrid controller exist. And over here on the top right-hand corner is the building we are isolating. Uh, for the microgrid, all kind of together in one, one nice little snapshot, a very nice picture. So uh, around October, um, once the system was commissioning, we went through a series of, of islanding tests, pretty much two main islanding tests. The one in October, the first one, uh, we planned an outage with the operations crew. Um, that's one of the other things that we've kind of learned about this, um, going through this demonstration phase is, you know, how to coordinate the base, you know, properly with, you know, doing planned outages or whatnot because that can take time and it takes coordination because the operations crew at the base, you know, they want to know what's going on. Um, the first test we, we ran um, because we're talking about isolating the system and generation assets and reconnecting the, um, you know, remote operated breaker back to the grid, the interconnects, inter interlocks that prevent, um, you know, uh, the voltage control of the battery, uh, you know, from happening when you reconnect. All those things were very important to be able to, to flush out uh, so that we knew that we weren't going to reconnect the system in an unsafe manner. So the first test was really to, you know, test the main breaker, the remote operation of the main breaker with a microgrid controller, and that all the interlocks that present, prevent an unsafe uh, reconnection, those were all working properly. Um, we also t tested the, the sequencing of transitioning entire system into islanding mode and out of islanding mode. Um, how does the battery behave? You know, there's a lot of things that go along with all these systems and a lot of devices that need to operate in conjunction with each other. It gets fairly complex. Um, and returning the system back from islanding mode. We learned a lot. Um, we had to make a lot of software updates to both our microgrid controller um, because of the way that we assumed a lot of the sequencing was going to occur. Uh, versus what was actually, you know, occurring from a, a, a reconnect application standpoint, as well as within the energy storage system itself. Um, the, the team from Primus was finding out that they had to update some of their sequencing so that they were um, safely uh, de-energizing the battery uh, and, and protecting the electronics for all of their energy cells. So we learned a lot from that first islanding test, kind of like a crawl, walk, run type, type of a mode. Uh, we repeated the test once we had that. We repeated the tests uh, in December of uh, uh, 2015. Um, in this particular uh, environment, we were ready to go. We were ready to actually uh, go through and conduct our, our full end-to-end -end islanding of the system. For this, we, we uh, added some extra loads. We had a um, Chevy Volt. Um, we wanted to see kind of like plug loads from a, an electric vehicle if that, that caused any issues on, on, from a power quality standpoint. Uh, so you can see up in the top left, um, we added this during the test. In the top right, you can see this is myself and the energy manager, Mick Wasco, at the base. We had a, a remote terminal in his office where we're monitoring the system and, and going in and out of island and mode, keeping track of the loads and the quality. Um, that same screen we're kind of showing right here where we can see the, the circuit layout and what the status is on all of the elements. We hooked up a lot of power analyzers in the building um, outside of, uh, on the uh, switch gear just to monitor the load at a very fine level to make sure we weren't seeing any inadvertent uh, ringing, transients, and stuff like that and flicker. We also connected another power analyzer to the PV system to make sure we were tracking that. And then um, we're able to switch the system over. Primus also had a lot of uh, monitoring and control going on uh, their battery to make sure everything was operating uh, properly. So we were collecting lots and lots of data, almost too much data. 
Here's a screenshot of the, um, what we call the HMI, the human machine interface during the, uh, the microgrid scenario. Uh, so this is what the end user at the base uh, can, is looking at from the standpoint of all the status of each of the elements kind of like at their fingertips. Keeping track of the load uh, at this particular uh, uh, location on the HMI, you can see what's going on. There's a rooftop inverter. There's a carport inverter. What power outputs are they currently uh, generating on? And what's the status of the energy storage system? How much energy capacity does it have remaining? What's its state of charge? And, and, and some measurement of power quality. All that's kind of at the fingertips of the end user during this testing period. So here's uh, the results of the actual islanding test. Uh, were pretty much um, started uh, right around that, the December 13th time period. You could see the battery charging uh, earlier in the morning. We were ready roughly around 9 o'clock in the morning, right around you know 9.20 time period. We said we're ready to pull the trigger. We hit the button. The system uh, disconnected uh, from the grid. Took about a couple minutes for this uh, battery to boot up, uh, about four minutes from the standpoint of where we pulled the 12 kV line and isolated power from the building. The battery picked up the, the, the initial load, roughly about 50 kilowatts uh, right away, started uh, powering, uh, uh, you know, the, all the load. You can see the, the load of the batteries kind of matching the load of the building. We wanted to, because we were kind of under the gun to get a lot of the data out as we can, we went through the building, turned on all the AC systems throughout, uh, also allowed the PV system uh, to kick on at this particular point in time. So once we got the load up to a, a certain level, you can see the PV system now started tracking with the building, trying to, um, you know, match and be managed by the IPEM uh, controller. And see the battery system started dropping its power levels to compensate for the fact that the battery or the PV system was now providing and sourcing more of the power. And as the PV system drops down low, we reduce the amount of PV power. You can see the battery responding and picking back up uh, the remaining load required. So we wanted to do lots of tests of how much PV can we uh, essentially get out for our particular islanding scenario. So therefore, we ratcheted it up the amount of PV penetration. We got it up to about 79%. It was not, you know, it was in the winter. Uh, we were basically maxed out the amount of PV we were getting out from one of the inverters because one of the other inverters um, had a fault on it. So we, we couldn't use it. We could only use one. So with that one single inverter, we maxed out the amount of PV generation, and the battery was able to handle it just, just fine. You can see it's now starting to source very little amount of power. Uh, so therefore, we wanted to monitor it throughout. Um, we let the, the loads float with the AC systems kind of kicking on. You can see, you know, them ramping up. You can see the PV system now starting to source a little bit more power, uh, and the battery kind of maintaining its power at the, the lower levels. We were fortunate enough during the island and event to actually have some clouds come over uh, because it was a winter day um, and start dropping the PV out of the system. Uh, we took some pictures. You can see right here some of the clouds that, that were rolling through. And so each time a big cloud rolled through and kind of, um, you know, put a shadow over the solar uh, PV carport, you could see the, the battery started uh, dropping out. In one, a couple instances, it dropped out 100%. And you can see the, the response of the battery picking that load back up uh, quite significantly. So we had lots of those events occur throughout the day. Uh, we monitored the power quality. The power quality maintained itself. We were, were we evaluated it per IEEE, and we had all those uh, uh, monitoring equipment kind of attached to the switch here. We let the system kind of run out as long as we could. Uh, we turned the AC systems back on roughly about 4 o'clock. We're getting ready to, um, you know, the sun's getting ready to set. The PV system's going to now start, you know, sourcing less and less power. Uh, we noticed the battery DC controls um, was having a little bit of an issue, so Primus wanted the opportunity to be able to go back and take a look. So at this particular point, uh, the system shut down. Uh, we ended the outage uh, roughly about, you know, uh, almost about 3 o'clock. It was about 2-something in the afternoon. Um, reconnected the system uh, roughly about 2.45, allowed power to get restored to the building and let the PV system kick back on. 
pretty exciting time in terms of uh, of end to end getting through a, a full islanding event and the results that that came uh, upon it. Did a lot of post data processing to make sure that, that power quality was maintained. Um, and so far, you know, everything was was managed per the IEEE guidelines. So, coming then towards the end, what did we learn out of all this? Um, Testing each of the elements, the battery, the microgrid controller, you know, testing at the lower levels, extremely important when you're, you're getting to the point where you're actually uh, connecting the system into uh, usable assets. You know, the people need to work in these buildings that, that we're connecting up to, so you've got to make sure everything works so that you're not damaging server hardware, computers, you know, assets that are important to the facilities. So, you know, consider doing high fidelity hardware in the loop testing. We leveraged NREL for, for ours um, in addition to some other um, low level testing we worked out with Primus. Extremely critical. Do not underestimate the amount of software required to make these systems operate smoothly. I think, you know, that's one of the other key lessons learned that we had on this, both in the, in the battery system because these things are very complex. Um, there's a lot of moving parts that, that need to be coordinated. Um, it takes a while, and you've got to make sure that, that your software is modeled, it's well organized, um, because you're going to have to make tweaks to this, make sure it's, it's, it's equipped for easy troubleshooting. Uh, if you have the ability to test the system without disrupting power, include that in your plan for these types of microgrids. Because, you know, I talked a little bit about the outages we tried to schedule with um, the bases. They require 21-day reviews, and then once that date's set, it's pretty much set in stone. So if you can do a lot of testing, you know, isolated, and you can set, a, set it up to not have to actually do an outage on the building, it will save you a lot of headache and a lot of time in the long run. Um, and make sure you've got good coordinated support from your operations crew at the facilities. Uh, conclusions for our particular program, we, part of the things we wanted to demonstrate was that, um, you know, Getting a diesel generator and using that as backup power with an automated transfer switch, it's a piece of cake. It's easy. Um, there's nothing, you know, a lot of that hardware exists and it's very low cost. Um, so how can energy storage compete with that type of uh, alternative? So that was one of the things that we wanted to try. Can we use energy storage can we, can we, as an alternative, you know, an all renewable based system not have to need a, a, a diesel generator? Um, from an environmental standpoint, um, as well as an, a, a return on investment standpoint. So the, the reality is, is that energy storage units and stuff like that, they're way more expensive. You've got to have their higher upfront capital costs. But the benefit you get out of this um, goes like to our secondary objective is when you can do peak shaving because you can't use a diesel generator, um, you know, for other things other than backup due to environmental restrictions unless you have a particular type of generator. So we could use this system for peak shaving. We demonstrated that. I didn't kind of go into much detail on it because it's pretty straightforward on how it worked. Uh, but you can use a battery for this, that particular application. All renewable microgrids without using a diesel generator, it's achievable. A lot of the things we had going into this is can you meet the power quality uh, measurements for that because you got all stiff inverter-based uh, generation sources. Because we did a lot of the testing at Enrol, and because we were able to prove this out in the field, this, this is capable. We, we demonstrate it and, it, and it works, even on the AC side of things. Um, advanced inverter controls. The existing assets that were at Miramar, uh, you know, the, they were PV powered and then they were advanced energy. Um, those assets were able to be upgraded to allow advanced control systems to them. So that was the other thing that kind of came out of this is that Existing assets that are basically what we'll call dumb, you know, that don't have smart grids, those things are capable um, if they can be uh, reprogrammed from that standpoint. So this program we did uh, add some increased capability to existing TV inverters that allowed it to interact with these microgrid scenarios. So, so that works pretty well. With that, that's the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you, Ryan, for this very informative presentation. I would like to remind our audience to submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of the screen. We have received a number of questions um, that Ryan will now answer. So Ryan, a question from the Army Corps of Engineers. What data analysis software was used, and is it commercially available uh, off the shelf? Yeah. So 
because uh, a lot of the power analyzers that we used were, um, they were Fluke brand power analyzers. They have kind of like their free power analyzer software for downloading the data um, as well as, um, uh, you know, you can look at, uh, you know, the output based on the settings of the power analyzer that, that you were collecting. So that we were using a Fluke 437 on the load data. Um, collecting it at, you know, kind of quarter second intervals, but the trigger points for um, some of the transient settings that we were looking at, you know, were much, much, much quicker sub-cycle type, type settings. And so that was collected with screenshots or whatnot, and it was all analyzed using the, the Fluke software. And it's free and it's available from their website. Wonderful. Thank you, Ryan. A question from the Navy. What type of maintenance does a flow battery require? <laughs> So the flow batteries themselves do require um, a certain amount of maintenance right now. Because we have Primus's first systems in the field, we're kind of learning about uh, the maintenance of that particular aspect. The electrolyte that they use needs to be monitored to make sure it's operating in its sweet zone. They have some level of controls that, that kind of monitor it and add you know, some elements to it to kind of keep it operating from a, um, you know, kind of like their secret sauce mixture of what they think is the, the most optimum time. Right now they're having to spend more time out there because they're learning themselves as to, you know, how to maintain this particular system and they're leveraging that and they're putting that information in their, what we'll call their Gen uh, 2 designs because the one that we have is basically a, the prototype out of the gate. So the, Zinc bromide systems, they do require maintenance and they do require, at least in the first year, um, you know, technicians from the company to come out, uh, assess it and monitor it. But because the system's kind of like in its early state, I don't know what degree once they kind of get it tuned in, how much it would be if it's just kind of like a routine, they come out once or twice a year. That was kind of the original intent for what we were uh, forecasting when we started the program. So, I mean, that would be my guess is the target that they're trying to get to, that, that it would require somebody to come out and check up on the system, make sure the electrolytes weren't in and all the other subsystems and, you know, safety elements are coming out, you know, a, a couple times a year. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, another question from the Army. Um, what protocol standards were developed and used? So um, it's kind of, there's a lot of protocols and standards in terms of, you know, a lot of the, the small devices that are used. Um, for this one, the, the microgrid controller and what we were interacting with, um, with the battery um, was kind of like a, a, an OPC interface for those two particular elements. We were also, because a lot of devices exist um, that already had kind of like their own protocols and interface, um, you know, there's Modbus, um, there's actual, you know, signals that we use, analog signals, digital signals um, throughout, um, but it was predominantly, you know, the OPC, um, you know, fiber over Ethernet, things like that, um, as well as, you know, Modbus type interfaces, both Modbus IP and Mod Mod Modbus RTU. Thank you. Uh, do you plan to study flow battery capacity degradation over time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things that we're trying to learn about during this um, test is to see, you know, how stable the system is. And that's something that Primus is keenly interested in, in as well. You know, they're, they're, they've designed the rest of their system, like all of the electrodes, everything. Everything for them, you know, is designed to last a, a very long time. So um, the degradation of the electrolytes is very important to them to make sure that um, the maintenance aspect, you know, like the question was asked earlier, that that's all nice um, and understood so that they can have a nice, easy to implement maintenance plan, and that's all they need to worry about, and that all the other elements of the system kind of will still operate for 10, 20 years. Great, thank you. Um, a question that folks can actually uh, find in the final report, and the link is up uh, online to your final report, Ryan, but can you talk a little bit about the total cost of the project? Yeah, I mean, that's a loaded question. The, uh, the contract that we had with, with the ESTCP was roughly, you know, about $3 million. Um, 
because the the program you know was leveraging and, and taking systems out of the lab and putting them in the demo, um, you know that that three million dollars didn't necessarily cover you know everything. Both Raytheon, Primus, you know had to make their own investments in terms of how we moved forward, like the NREL testing that we wanted to do. Um, that was an investment Raytheon made um, to, to reduce the risk on the program and, and learn a lot on the development of our microgrid controller. The, um, you know, Primus, you know, to, to their credit, you know, they, they, they worked really hard on, you know, um, you know, making sure that they were building the system uh, as best they could, you know, to deliver what they could. So they had to, you know, make their own investments in terms of getting the, the, the system ready to go because it was their first, you know, they, they, they knew they had to be able to put some of that into this in order to be able to get a system delivered out. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I don't want to divulge the actual uh, numbers because it, I don't even think I know off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, program was roughly about $3 million, but I can tell you that that cost a little bit more than that in order to get this thing actually fielded. Great, thank you. And then one final question before we turn it over to John. Uh, will the equipment remain in place after the demonstration? And if so, how will the system be operated during normal operating conditions? Yeah, okay. So, so the intent is that the system will remain in place. At least that was the, the overall goal for, for the demonstration project. We, you know, as part of the ESTCP program, right, you know, it's a, it's a demo project, but the hope is that at the end of the project, you know, the functionality of the system meets the objectives uh, and then the, the, the end user and the, the government has the decision of whether or not they want to transfer it over uh, and keep it at their particular location. So right now, you know, talking with the, the base and stuff like that, yeah, they, they want to keep it, they, they want to leverage it. Um, it does require some uh, elements of um, operational um, autonomy that, that needs to occur. You know, with, there's some safety things we got to make sure are connected to the fire department. Um, those, those elements, um, as well as training that needs to be applied to the end users of how do you use the system, how do you interact with the microgrid controller, and how do you recognize from um, you know, an operational standpoint of how the battery needs, needs to function. All that's kind of being flushed out right now because we just finished the, the demonstration elements, but the intent right now is, and the hope is that the system functions, it functions well enough to where we can transition this over to an end user operator. Um, we're not quite there yet because um, we're still ironing out some uh, bugs in terms of um, uh, making sure that the interactions with the microgrid controller and the fault clearing capabilities of, of how do you manage the system are all flushed out, but that's, that's the intent. Thank you, Ryan. We have about 20 more questions that we're not going to get to during this Q&A session, but we'll leave them until the end of the webinar and try to get to them. At this point, I, I do want to introduce our uh, second speaker, uh, John Sosell, who is the Director of um, the Building Grid Technologies Unit at Bosch, which currently focuses on uh, building scale direct current microgrid activities. As a 25 plus year veteran at Bosch, uh, John has held a variety of positions, including chief engineer with the responsibility for developing highly reliable and cost-effective electronic products for automotive applications. Uh, John was also responsible for launching the solar energy division of Bosch in North America. He earned an electrical engineering degree from the General Motors Institute in Michigan, now known as the Kettering University, and he holds several patents related to incorporating solar PV into DC building micro microgrids. And with that, I turn it over to you, John. Thank you, Rula. First, I'd like to just uh, quickly go over the agenda, the topics I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first, I want to give some background as to why we talk about uh, direct current or DC in buildings, uh, the, the benefits of DC versus AC. Uh, we are focusing on commercial building applications, and I'll explain why as well as what the ideal commercial building would look like. I want to review the installation we did for the ESTCP which was at Fort Bragg for the Department of Defense. Also some other pilot projects we're working on in the same concept. Um, then a cost benefit analysis, how do we sell this? Uh, what are the benefits um, to a building owner? And then the conclusions and, and next steps. 
So first a bit about DC and AC. Uh, you may be familiar with DC from toy batteries and AC is basically the alternating current what's coming out of the, the outlets in your, ho in your house. But why is there alternating current? Historically, the utility was generating power, is generating power in remote locations, and they need to transmit the power over long distances. So alternating was current as, uh, was chosen as the easiest way to step the voltage up and transmit it over long distance. That was the technology available at the time. It was a good choice at the time, and I think we'll be living with that infrastructure for a long time in the future. But what, what's very interesting is when you look into buildings itself, and I'll start with uh, the electrical loads in the building or the devices that use energy in the building. Most things in a building now use direct current, even today, internally. So if we look at uh, efficient lighting technologies like LED lighting, but also all fluorescent lighting, induction lighting, internally these utilize direct current. Uh, efficient motors, which are moving to variable frequency drives to get variable speed, they all internally use direct current, and those are used in industrial fans, which we used in our demonstration project, but also HVAC, air conditioning equipment, refrigeration, automation, assembly lines. Um, these all use uh, variable frequency drive motors or moving toward those uh, for energy efficient reasons, and those internally use DC. Electric vehicle chargers are DC based because the batteries in the, in the car are, uh, are, are DC. Also, IT equipment, um, not just you. You might notice your laptop has a little brick that plugs in the wall. That's an AC to DC conversion, but also servers, which use a tremendous amount of power, and data centers are, are DC-based. If we look at the sources of electricity, which are now moving to, to buildings like solar panels on the roof, but also modern generators, um, diesel generators, gas generators, gen sets, uh, CHP, combined heat power generators, wind, and fuel cells all internally use uh, direct current. Even if you have a small uh, portable generator in your garage, if it's a modern generator, it, it generates DC and it has an inverter on the output. And then if we look at storing energy locally in buildings, battery technologies, ultra capacitors, flywheels, and there's, there's demonstrations and talk about using electric vehicles bidirectionally as energy storage, that would also be DC. And those are very important because it's, it's DC uh, in both directions. So all of these devices and buildings are, are at DC or moving toward DC uh, in, in modern applications. So in order to work with the utility grid, they all need to do conversions to AC. So if we look inside of these devices, uh, I mentioned the laptop computer has a visible DC to, or AC to DC converter. Most of these devices is internal, but there is a conversion of the power from alternating current to direct current, and that takes additional electronics. When we have sources of power on a building or in a building, we go through an opposite, a DC to AC conversion in order to be able to power the other devices connected to the building and supply power. Energy storage devices, again, internally are using DC. They go through a conversion in both directions. So that requires additional electronics, which is um, a cost and, and a reliability concern. So where do we start? If we have all of these DC devices and buildings uh, already, but we, they're, all up, they're all designed to operate with the utility grid, how do we develop that into a system? And this is the, the concept that we're working on and what we demonstrated now in the, in the DOD project. We had to start somewhere. We know that many buildings will be upgraded to LED lighting in the future. There will be a wave of upgrades. So in our system, we, we concentrated as lighting and LED lighting as the core load that we want to focus on. On the generation side, more and more buildings are incorporating solar panels on the roof, which are, are DC. So the core system that we started with is a commercial building uh, focused on lighting, uh, either a new building that's being built with LED lighting or a retrofit of an existing building, and then where solar would be on the, on the roof. So to look at the advantages of a DC system versus an AC system, we first want to briefly review the, the disadvantages of an AC system. So if you have solar panels on the roof of the building, the generating DC, they will go through an inverter 
which converts the DC to AC in order to connect up to the rest of the building. Even if they're on the roof of the building, they're effectively connected to the utility grid at that point. Then, as I mentioned, all the devices in the building, like lighting, and, uh, which is our core uh, technology we're focusing on, but we also demonstrated in this uh, DoD project a uh, large industrial ceiling fan. Those have AC to DC converters as the first stage inside of them in order to, to utilize the utility power. So between the inverter converting the solar energy to AC and then the, the uh, rectifiers are called inside of the devices converting AC back to DC, there's significant losses. The inverter is about a 2 to 8% loss of the energy generated from solar. And then the rectifiers lose about a fixed 4%. The reason that this varies, it actually varies a lot depending on, on the weather conditions. So when it's sunny, uh, middle of the day, you might get closer to 2%. Uh, modern inverters talk about having 98% efficiency. That's at or near their peak power. Uh, but many times the inverter, it's, it's cloudy out or it's not the middle of the day and they have a significantly uh, higher loss. So if you add these two losses together and you, you average it over weather conditions across the year, what we found is you get about a 7 to 10 percent loss of your solar energy. And it, it may not sound like much, but it's very significant when you're investing perhaps a million dollars on a rooftop solar in a large, a large uh, building array and losing 7 to 10 percent of that energy over a 25 or more year lifetime. So how do we uh, improve that system and avoid those losses? So what our system does is it ties solar directly to building loads which have been modified to operate on DC. And the modification is actually a removal of the, of the electronics in a simplification. That avoids this 7 to 10% energy loss. Uh, but we can't have a building that's simply powered by solar. If a cloud comes by, the lights would dim. So we added a device we call it a, a power server, and that fills in missing power from solar through uh, the utility grid. This is the simplest implementation of our, of our DC microgrid. Solar tied to lighting and optional other loads, and then a u utility grid connection through what we're calling a, a power server to provide fill-in power. So the basic idea is that this system is focused on a DC connection between the devices to get the most energy effective use of those renewable energy sources that are on the building uh, while using the utility grid secondarily, whereas a conventional system is focused on using the utility grid as the primary. And because of that, there are a lot of energy losses. What we also found uh, in terms of benefits, so we have the lower energy losses resulting in a 7 to 10 percent improvement in utilization of on-site generation. We're doing solar energy, but this would also be true, for example, um, a fuel cell that was on site or a gen set. There's significantly higher reliability, and this is because the, the most unreliable part of a, of a solar installation is the inverter. The panels on the building will last much longer than the inverter itself. Inverters typically replace two, maybe three times in the life, lifetime. And within, uh, take lighting for an example, as we move toward LED lighting, the LEDs themselves have very, very long lifetime. And it's the electronics associated with it that is now going to become the weak link. If we move to DC, that electronics is no longer the weak link and it will last as long as the, the lighting itself. So that's significant and especially as we talk about some of our target, target applications which are high bay buildings, there is significant cost in, in maintaining lights which are 30, 40 feet in the air. The other thing we gain as kind of a side benefit is resiliency during grid outages. If you look at the AC system, because the utility grid is effectively in the middle of this chain, if the utility grid goes out, if you have a blackout, you cannot easily get your solar energy to the building. So most systems are, are uh, the inverter is designed just to shut off completely uh, for safety reasons and that cuts off your ability to use that. Because we have this direct connection from solar energy to the loads, we can continue to run the building off of the PV, and by adding a small amount of battery capacity inside of the power server, we can also supplement and do things like emergency lighting in a, in a very cost-effective way. By adding more battery storage onto the system, 
in DC, we can also uh, obtain an, an optional amount of uh, energy security based on the particular application need. So this somewhat comes for free, and it's very um, dramatic when we do a, a demonstration of the islanding of a DC microgrid. The lights don't even blink. If the grid shuts off and there's PV available or batteries on, on the system, uh, the system just could, keeps operating. There's no, no switching, no transfer, uh, because the direct current is already connected to the loads. The interconnection costs are actually quite a significant soft cost of, of connecting solar up to a grid or any um, a grid connected device when feeding in. We could reduce or in some cases completely eliminate the interconnection costs. The system, the DC system on the, on the bottom to the utility just happens to look like a, a lighting system, for example, that uses less power when the sun shines, but it's not directing that solar energy through the utility grid, so the utility grid wouldn't necessarily need to have an interconnection approval. Because we remove a lot of the electronics in the system, there is lower upfront investment, and of course, any time we can make a more energy efficient system, we reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So to talk about in this system, what's the ideal building look like? I mentioned commercial buildings, and there's a very good reason for that. We are trying to align the generation of DC power, in this case solar, with the use of DC power. And commercial buildings are typically on and typically on during the day. So the more that we can align the generation of solar with the use of solar, uh, we will gain the maximum advantage uh, with direct current. This is why we're not focusing, for example, on, on houses, which many times people are away at work when they're generating solar. We're targeting first uh, constant DC loads. I mentioned LED lighting as the core. We also demonstrated industrial ceiling fans as uh, in, in this DoD project, and so those are available also for, for demonstration. This is very attractive for what's called a big box building, a warehouse, maintenance facility, manufacturing plant, fitness center, parking structure, retail, etc. Uh, they have hundreds of lights, which are often uh, hung high in the air, so the maintenance costs are, are quite significant. Because this system is more reliable and, and the lighting, the electronics are more reliable, it saves a lot of operation and maintenance costs over lifetime. These buildings are typically big, flat roof buildings, so they have a lot of space for a solar PV array. And they often will use uh, industrial ceiling fans. So uh, that is an optional load that we have available, and it's many times a, a very good uh, addition for uh, to improve the energy efficiency and comfort of the buildings anyway. So I want to talk about our ESTCP project first. It was a demonstration project. The location is Fort Bragg. It ended up being a very good fit for the demonstration. We approached Fort Bragg to see if they wanted to host the, the demonstration, and they were the ones that suggested a fitness center. It's a little bit smaller than what we target, as our buildings, but it's very representative. It has two high bay areas. Uh, it has daytime operation all week long, uh, which was important. If the building is closed on a Saturday or a Sunday, you could still implement the system, but for those Saturday and Sundays, you're basically the same as an AC system. You have to either feed the excess solar energy back into the utility grid and go through the conversion. So again, you're on par with an AC system or you have to have a lot of battery storage to store the entire weekend of, of energy. So being operating all day is, is um, the maximum uh, advantage. This had a newer roof, which was good for solar. I mentioned two high bay areas, one a basketball court and one a high bay weight room. This building and all of the fitness centers in Fort Bragg are used as emergency shelters. So the ability for us to island and, and keep the lights and ventilation going uh, was an advantage to this building. It was in need of upgrades. It had inefficient metal halide lights, as many buildings do, and the weight room actually needed more ventilation, so it was an advantage to install in this particular building. The plan was we just replaced the existing high bay uh, metal halide lights, so it was 44 lights. 
we left in four AC lights, or, or let's say we replaced four AC lights with four equivalent high efficiency DC lights of the same type as our, as our I'm sorry, AC lights of the same type as our DC light for comparison. We also installed a reference solar array on the roof and a small inverter, so we made an entire reference AC system to compare side by side with our DC system. This is a picture of the installation in the basketball court. It's very standard, and I, I kind of want to walk through what it looks like to put a DC microgrid in. Another reason we're focusing on lighting and, in this case, uh, ceiling fans is these circuits are isolated from the rest of the building. So in order to deploy DC in buildings, we think it'll be a long time before the entire building is DC and everything you plug into the, the wall could be DC. But there are subsystems in buildings like lighting and these ventilation fans, HVAC systems, which are already isolated on their own circuit. So putting a DC microgrid in for these subsystems is very simple. To replace the lighting, um, it would be good to time this with a lighting upgrade. Instead of putting an AC LED light in, you put a DC LED light in. And then you isolate those circuits and run them on DC. We use the, reuse the wiring in the building. So we didn't change the wiring at all. The wiring doesn't care if it's uh, operating on DC or AC. The voltage our system runs at is a nominal 380 volts DC, which uh, operates uh, within the, the, the wiring rating. The wires are rated for 600 volts DC, so we're well below the rating of the, of the wiring. This is a picture of the weight room. Again, another high bay building, two fans, and uh, replacing the AC lights, which were previously metal halide, you can see the old light here, with, uh, with new DC lights. The rooftop solar installation is exactly the same as it would be for an AC system. Because solar panels produce DC, typically all the wiring on the roof is already DC, and, and at the ground level is where it would typically come into uh, an inverter and become AC. So we can contract regular solar installers to install the PV array, and we say simply leave off the inverter, and we will connect that up to our DC microgrid. And inside the building, when we're hanging the lights, we can contract regular electricians because the lights are hung the same way a, a replacement light would be on an AC side. In this particular installation, you'll see in the lower corner here, this is the DC power server. So that's where the DC power is going into the, the lighting circuits and the fan circuit. This large panel is something we have only in our pilot projects, and it's shown on, on the right-hand side. This contains a tremendous amount of instrumentation because we're measuring every energy level, all the energy flows, comparison between the AC and the DC system uh, in order to, to validate the advantages. Our normal commercial installations would not need all of that. Uh, extra instrumentation. For this application, we put a, a nice set of controls behind the front desk of the fitness center. It's a touchpad. We have very modern communications. It's a modern lighting system. Uh, in this case, they can control the fans and the, the lighting from the touch screen. We also remotely monitor the system and uh, are logging all of the energy savings, and we'll be doing that for the remainder of the project, which is about another year. This is what the high-level results look like so far. Uh, and there's uh, two columns that are relevant here. I mentioned that we installed a conventional AC system. So the AC system has conventional AC lights and an inverter. The lights are running about a 7% energy loss. The inverter averaging about 5.5% energy loss. So the energy loss of solar energy to lights in this case, is 12.5%. Uh, there is a small DC loss within the lighting. We, we still have to do a basically a DC-DC conversion or a voltage to current conversion, but it's a very low 3%. Uh, again, about 4% better than what you would get in, the, in, in a state-of-the-art best case uh, AC light. So when we compare the two, we're running about a 9.5% advantage uh, in our DC system versus our reference AC system. This has not been running for a long period of time. We plan to run it over an entire year. And it's interesting, the inverter actually loses more power in the wintertime, uh, which we would expect because it's operating more at its lower power levels. 
So the, the DC system outperforms the AC system more in wintertime, less in summertime. But again, we um, modeled across the entire year that we would have about a 7 to 10 percent improvement uh, in any climate within the U.S. for a DC system. So the phase one solar array is about 45 kilowatts it's installed. We just installed a second PV array, um, 108 kilowatts. And the purpose of this is we're going to add, as you'll see in the next picture, a large amount of energy storage uh, linked to this second solar array. And we're going to demonstrate the, the uh, uh, energy security benefit of having a large amount of solar and a large amount of uh, battery capacity for a relatively small building. And we'll be able to size it and, and simulate different sizes and different solar to show the DOD the levels of energy security that can be selected. Again, our base system, our core system, can operate with no batteries at all and still gain the energy efficiency advantages. That's what we showed with phase one. But by adding battery capacity and solar, here's, here's the battery, we can also gain a, a large amount of, uh, let's say, an adjustable amount of uh, energy security. A small amount of batteries in the system could provide emergency lighting, which is needed in all buildings, for a very, very cost-effective uh, uh, addition to the system. Um, but again, a large amount, in this case, of a container-sized battery system can be added to add any level of energy security that's desired. So we finished our Fort Bragg installation, and we have about a year left on the demonstration project where we'll be measuring and, and uh, publishing a lot of the results and demonstrating all the different functionality, um, especially along the side of the, the energy storage. Uh, but during the development of this, we also built a core system, no energy storage, um, in Charlotte, which is where our engineering center is for this project, which is identical to the Fort Bragg system. And we did a lab system very early on when we were uh, proposing the demonstration to demonstrate on, on the lab side. Uh, but underway currently, uh, we are installing this DC microgrid in the Bosch headquarters up in Michigan, in the Detroit area. And we're expanding our lab here in Mooresville, North Carolina, near Charlotte, uh, to be a, a, a much larger type system. We were also awarded a project through the California Energy Commission, um, also much uh, uh, credit due to the ESTC project that we had shown the concept already at Fort Bragg. California Energy Commission is very interested, and Honda has uh, agreed to host it at a large warehouse they have in California. This will be 175 kilowatt DC load, which is about 600 lights uh, plus, um, I believe, about 12, 13 ceiling fans. And we're also going to be demonstrating forklift chargers powered by DC, uh, as well as um, three large container size energy storage systems. That will be built, it's being designed right now, and that will be built before the end of this year. So, what does this look like to? a customer or a user or a facility manager. Uh, we did a case study, and this is a, a hypothetical case study, but based on the experience from our installations. If you take a California warehouse, for example, has 100 lights, they're metal halide lights, and they're decided that they want to upgrade to LED lighting. 48 kilowatts of metal halide light in that type of building uh, would require only about 20 kilowatts of, of LED lighting. So there's a significant energy savings whether you do DC or AC. And then adding a solar PV array of 52 kilowatts would provide about 89% of the energy for lighting. So this was the case study. The case number one is using conventional technology, AC technology. Uh, there would be a significant savings over doing nothing. But then if you do exactly the same design with DC, if you look at the energy savings, uh, the better utilization of the solar, and especially also the reliability improvement over a 25-year lifetime, uh, you'll see about a 30% improvement in the, the uh, lifetime costs of that equivalent DC system versus an equivalent AC system. So in conclusion, the, the benefits of the, the Bosch DC microgrid, as we're calling, are, are proven. There is inherent resiliency provided um, by a DC system, which gives energy security, 7 to 10% better utilization of local energy sources. Uh, higher reliability through reduced electronics, which result in about a 30% lower lifetime costs 
uh, over the 25 year or more lifetime of the system. We are ready for first commercial applications. The core DC load is LED lighting, so, so we're interested in projects where uh, new construction or a retrofit where a um, building is being retrofit to LED lighting. It's ideal for a big box type building, and the type of lighting we have available right now is uh, primarily high day lighting. But again, we would consider any, um, any projects. Economics is best with daytime seven day operation. Uh, daytime is, is ideal, 24 seven is okay. Again, if the building is closed on weekends, for example, then the system on weekends would perform like a, a conventional system. So Bosch is seeking projects for 2017 installation. If, if there are any DOD projects or commercial projects in the audience, uh, my contact information is shown here. So um, feel free to contact me also if there's any questions about, about the system. Great. Thank you, John, for an excellent presentation. We've received a number of questions. Uh, can you please tell us if such a DC microgrid would be compliant with the National Electrical Code? Yes, so the National Electrical Code does allow DC. I mentioned that all the solar array that put, is put on the rooftop of the building is wired with DC. So the code, and, and we built these uh, demonstration projects um, referencing the code. So throughout the code, DC is addressed, but it's, it's somewhat spread out around the code. So something we did to, to uh, avoid having to explain this to electricians and explain it to inspectors is we were heavily involved in the writing of the 2017 electrical code. So the final draft is completed, and the 2017 code has a new article written in it called DC microgrids. So it's not that the, uh, the, the older code didn't allow DC, but the newer code is going to be very much one-stop shopping, one section that we can point to for installation electricians and inspectors and, and, and say, here's an area that will show you, it will point you to all the other areas of the code that you need to understand in order to install uh, DC in a building. Great, thank you. Can you also tell us if there's been any third party validation of the efficiency gains of your DC microgrid system? Yes, we were involved with the Department of Energy and specifically the National Renewable Energy Lab. Uh, NREL did a simulation study of uh, the performance of our system across the entire U.S. We can do these uh, pilot projects in different areas and, and measure our data, uh, but it, again, takes us a year to, to really look at all seasons. So they simulated it using their solar models and their energy efficiency models and validated the, the results that we were seeing and mapped it across the U.S. Very interesting thing, they found another piece that we didn't uh, anticipate that is significant is when you have energy losses through AC uh, to DC conversion in lights specifically or any devices within the building, that loss is basically going into heat. So they pointed out and they modeled that that heat is being generated into the building, and then that heat has to be removed by the air conditioning system in summer. So there's, there's actually a, a multiplicative effect of uh, reducing the losses uh, because we also reduce the, the air conditioning load. And they actually modeled that across the U.S. and just showed that there was an additional advantage to a DC system in areas that had especially uh, heavy air conditioning loads. Thank you very much. Um, can you elaborate on the reliability improvements from a DC microgrid? Yeah, so I mentioned that we reduce the electronics, but um, more specifically, we reduce the, the uh, conversions AC to DC, which require uh, electrical components called electrolytic capacitors. And electrolytic capacitors have a wear mechanism. So after a period of time, and it can be calculated, they will eventually lose capacitance and, and fail. And in lighting, uh, for example, many facilities are used to changing out fluorescent light bulbs. And so if the electronics in, in a fluorescent light, it's called the, the ballast, if that fails once in a while, it wasn't a big deal. You're, you're likely, you have crews or you're up in the ceiling changing these fluorescent tubes anyway. But as we move to LED lighting, the changing of the tubes is no longer going to be required. And so the electronics, it will become uh, the significant cost in, in LED, I mean the failure of the electronics. 
when we move to, and, and within the electronics, it's the electrolytic capacitors within the rectifier section which are wearing out. In the DC system, we do not need uh, that rectification system. We do not need the electrolytic capacitors. And so we can build the electronics which can last the lifetime of the LEDs themselves. And so this is going to be a, a significant um, uh, value to the DC system and something that may not be appreciated initially, but we truly can make a, a lighting upgrade, a, a set it and forget it. You change out your, your lights to LED lights, and there is no regular maintenance required for the, for the life of that, uh, of that system. Thank you. Uh, and one uh, final question for you uh, before we pull in, uh, pull Ryan back in. Um, can you please provide additional details on the basis for the 30% life cycle savings estimate that you provided? Yeah, and sure. I, and I would be glad for any uh, projects that are being considered, we can go through an exact calculation. But the key, I, I mentioned there's a 7 to 10% uh, energy savings. So over the lifetime, that is, is a, a contributing factor to the 30%. The devices themselves for DC do cost less. There's less um, electronics in all these devices, so there is some upfront savings. We can quote a system um, for a lower cost than an equivalent AC system uh, for, so let's say, a lighting upgrade, a solar installation. Uh, so that adds in, into the 30%. And then the reliability piece of it. Generally, we were quite conservative, and we said for the electronics that needs to be replaced in the, the solar, meaning the, um, the inverter, it's normally calculated that during the lifetime of the solar panels, the inverter would be replaced. And then in the, in the lighting or the other electrical loads, uh, the lighting electronics, uh, ballasts, I mentioned the example of ballasts, those would be replaced. We were conservative. We said that our system would be twice as reliable in terms of the, the cost to replace any electronics. Um, we actually feel it will be much more than that. So if you add all these factors together, lower upfront costs, better utilization of your investment in, in solar energy, uh, and the, the improved reliability, uh, which lowers your maintenance costs, that adds up to 30% or more. Thank you so much, John. Now here are a couple of questions that I would appreciate both of you uh, weighing in on. So maybe starting with Ryan. Um, both of your systems involve battery storage. What do you think is the best battery chemistry for use in stationary storage? Ryan? Um, I don't think there is one particular chemistry that's better than anyone else, at least in my experience. Um, some of the microgrid applications that we've gone through, we've got a couple ongoing. Um, the operational characteristics become important. What are you going to integrate with? Do you need something that is um, higher response rate, you know, higher power output, but you don't energy capacity is not as important. Um, so therefore, your trade space is more on the lithium ion and um, uh, you know, capacitors to some, to some degree, or hybrid options that tend to be um, looked at favorably in that consideration. Or, you know, for like the, the Miramar one, energy capacity seems to be uh, more important uh, because of the uh, current assets that they want to interact with. So I don't think there's a silver bullet, at least in my personal experience and all the technologies that we've evaluated that, that says this one's the best than, than any other. Um, I think there's probably a handful of um, companies out there that have mature technologies that are easier to implement than others. Um, I know a lot of the advancements in, in, in the lithium-ion realm, you know, provide a lot of kind of like, you know, easy to install installations as they exist right now. Um, but the lower cost elements, um, if you, if you want to go, the, there's not as many companies out there that, that really are, are, are invested in, in the real low cost, you know, maybe larger footprint applications, um, you know, kind of like the flow battery technologies or other technologies, the low tech type solutions. So, I mean, there is no silver bullet, you know, to, to, to you know, reiterate that in that each application requires, you know, some level of diligence on, you know, what is it that you particularly need uh, in terms of the performance of the battery um, and then reduce your trade space to interact with those particular applications. John, can you please weigh in? 
Yeah, so I, I uh, basically agree with uh, everything Ryan said. Um, the demonstration projects we're doing, uh, the Fort Bragg project uh, was a lithium-ion based battery technology, uh, but our project that we're doing for the California Energy Commission is a flow battery. So again, from a, a DC, AC standpoint, um, all batteries are DC and, and we're agnostic as to which uh, particular technology we use. Uh, but one thing I, I would add, again, agreeing with everything that, that Ryan said is, if you're looking just at the building level, to your extent of being able to control the other loads in your building and, and what's happening uh, in terms of the, the peak load, I think that also has an impact on what battery technology you would choose. If, if I look at our DC microgrid, we're putting, we're replacing everything uh, with DC and the devices we're putting in, we have a tremendous amount of control over. We can vary the speed of these fans or vary the speed of an HVAC system. We don't have to turn all the HVAC systems on at the same time. So the more control you have over your loads, the less need you have for a large amount of, of battery uh, power capability. So you don't have to counteract a lot of loads turning on with a battery filling in. If you can manage your loads and, and manage that peak through, um, through what you're doing with the devices, your control devices, then your, your battery probably ha needs to have less power but more energy, more kilowatt hours. Um, so in our DC microgrid, we're, we're seeing that something we can do with load management um, is, is adjust our loads. Something we can't do that um, a battery with a lot of energy storage capability could help with is uh, the solar is generated the most in the middle of the day, and often things like your air conditioning load are the greatest in, uh, later in the afternoon. So you have to bridge that gap, not at a high power level, but you have to bridge that gap with, with energy. Store the energy in the middle of the day and then uh, give it back to the building uh, later in the day. So in that case, something like a, a flow battery, which has a, a longer uh, energy uh, storage capability for the, the cost you have, but maybe a less instantaneous power capability uh, would fit. If you have a building where you have a lot of AC loads, which are creating a high level of peak and you don't have an ability to, to really control that, um, then, then I think something like a lithium ion battery with a large amount of instantaneous power capability would be a really good fit. Great. Thank you both. One last question uh, for both of you. If we assume that we do not put a value on energy security and therefore cannot include it in a life cycle cost analysis, um, what are the applications where investments in a battery energy storage system uh, are life cycle cost effective? Ryan? That one's hard because without the energy security aspect, the ROI becomes, you know, at least in a lot of the applications we've looked at, um, becomes relatively difficult with the exception of um, particular, particular regional locations um, that have um, very, very high utility rates in terms of uh, demand charges and their load profile uh, for those particular locations, um, put them in that, that kind of a category so, so that their bills that they're receiving from the utility companies or whatnot are predominantly based off of, um, you know, demand charge um, uh, accruals. Other than that, if you're, you're relying just kind of like on, you know, energy, you know, dollar, uh, you know, cents per kilowatt hour type, type of calculations, it's very hard to get the ROI um, in any reasonable time period, just because right now the energy storage space, it's still kind of early stages in terms of, you know, there's there, there certain aspects of technologies that exist today, and they have their price point. And until they get that price point down um, further, then the ROIs are going to be very difficult to, to, to make sense unless they're, they're, they're operating in these kind of like isolated regional type, type applications. So without the energy security aspect, it makes that calculation very, very hard. Would you like to weigh in, please? Yeah, so uh, I agreed uh, exactly uh, with Brian what said. Um, 
maybe a sub couple of case examples where there could be a, a case for it. I mentioned emergency lighting. All buildings have batteries in them for emergency lighting, all commercial buildings. Whether these batteries are distributed in the, in the lights throughout the building, maybe every 10th or 20th light, or in, in larger commercial buildings, there's typically a central system with, with batteries. Um, this is the case, I guess, where there's not a generator for the entire building. Uh, but that, in our DC microgrid configuration, we can do that emergency lighting uh, feature uh, basically for free. Uh, the, the batteries would be added, and we already have the ability to feed that battery capacity into all of the lights, select which ones are going to be emergency lighting. And if that battery capacity has to be in the building for emergency lighting and it's sitting there uh, anyway, you could do things like a small amount of peak shaving, for example. The other case I would point out, um, there's a lot of talk of using electric vehicles. Electric vehicles might be parked in the parking lot of a, of a commercial building and just sitting there all day long. Um, there's discussion with the, with the car companies, you know, is there an ability to draw upon that energy during peaks and then as long as we give it back by the end of the day, um, that could be an area where, where the economics make some sense. Great. Thank you so much for both of you for a fantastic webinar. I'd like to remind our audience members that the next webinar in the series is on Thursday, May 19, and it will involve training developed from a collaborative effort between Startup ESCCP and the Intergovernmental Data Quality Task Force. And the focus of the training will be quality assurance project plans for use um, in advanced geophysical classification um, for munition uh, response investigations. Registration is open for this webinar, so please visit the Startup and ESCCP webinar webpage to register for this and other future webinars. Uh, before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this time if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. Uh, this concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for participating. <laughs>